Hello, everyone. Uh, we are now in our ninth and final uh, sermon in this series. Again, this series is part of a much bigger series on the Sermon on the Mount, um, but all of uh, the ones I've been doing sort of uh, fit together and flow together. But, but this last one in particular, it's special because it's going to be covering not just the, the previous eight, but it's going to be covering uh, the whole series, the whole Sermon on the Mount, one big overview. And, and so because we are covering the whole thing with, uh, with this sermon, we're going to uh, have our scripture reading be the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount yet again. We're going to read uh, starting in chapter 5 of, of the Gospel according to Matthew, uh, chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. Um, you know what? Let's add in 11 and 12 as well. Sure. So, here we go. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for the people of God. In the Christian TV series, The Chosen, uh, the second season ends with Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount. And, and earlier in the episode, Jesus, he comes up with his beginning, the Beatitudes. And in describing it to his disciple Matthew, he describes the Beatitudes as a map. Directions where people should look to find me. If someone wants to find me, these are the groups they should look for. Now, it's an apt description of the list because on the one hand, we find Jesus reaching out to the poor in spirit and, and sitting down with those who are far from righteous. Right? The, the people who we suspect God doesn't much favor and, and the people who we most expect God to want nothing to do with, well, that's who Jesus was seeking out and spending time with. That's who Jesus was offering the blessings of forgiveness and healing and, and above all else, a relationship. And then, in the second half of the Beatitudes, we find a description of Jesus' disciples and followers they are merciful, they are pure in heart, they are spreading peace, and they are being persecuted uh, because of it and because of Jesus. But despite the persecution, they have found the secret to the blessed life of the kingdom of heaven, a relationship with their creator. They are called children of God. And thus... The Beatitudes serve as a sort of map of where to find Jesus. If you are looking and seeking and you want to find Jesus, then look for the people Jesus is ministering to and seek out the people Jesus is ministering through. Seek out those who are being salt and light. But the Beatitudes are not the only map in the sermon. Uh, there are many more maps that can be found within. Uh, for example, take the section 
in the second half of, of Matthew chapter 5, and uh, it's, it's going to be Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 48. And in this part, six times we find a dual phrase. You have heard that it was said, but I tell you. The, the whole section is about how we treat people. Uh, but the first and the, the last teachings pair nicely. Uh, it, it opens with Jesus telling us about uh, uh, telling us how to treat our brothers and sisters so as to keep them from becoming our enemies, while it ends with Jesus telling us how we should treat our enemies in such a way that they stop being our enemies. So he, he says, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, and, and love them just as your heavenly Father does, because as God's children, you should mimic and take after him. And thus, it is not just instructions on our behavior, but it is a map that, if followed, leads us to have fulfilling interpersonal relationships, and it leads us to experiencing the blessed life of the kingdom. Now, uh, this section is then followed by the section on giving, prayer, and fasting. It would have been the first sermon in, in this series of nine, uh, but... Matthew chapter 6, 1 through 18, uh, three times Jesus tells us to not be like the hupocrites, right? Uh, to not be like the actors who give, pray, and fast publicly to earn applause. Do not be like them, Jesus says. Do not do these things for the wrong reasons. Instead, Jesus says, give and pray and fast in secret. Do it for the right reasons. Do it genuinely and do it secretly so as to protect yourself against a shift in motivation. And, and do not worry if nobody else sees what you do. Your heavenly father will see it and will reward you. And the best reward God can offer us is a relationship. Right? It's right there in the Beatitudes. The, the best gift God can give us is himself. The best blessing God can bestow upon us is to call us his children. And so while the previous section was a map to fulfilling interpersonal relationships, this part that follows serves as a map to accepting and participating in and maintaining the greatest treasure that we can possess, a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And from there, Jesus invites us into a more uh, introspective search. Uh, introspection being the examination or observation of one's own mental and emotional processes. Uh, you see, the reality is all three of these sections, they deal with, with three relationships. Our relationship with others, our relationship with God, and our relationships with ourselves. But each section takes a primary focus, all right? And so the first one was about us and others. The second one's primary focus was us and God. And this third section focuses on our relationship with ourselves. So uh, Jesus invites us to wrestle with our own propensity towards idolatry, uh, challenging us to choose God over money, for example, as the master of our lives. And then Jesus bids us to struggle against our own tendency to worry, daring us to, to spend our primary efforts chasing after the kingdom, uh, followed by Jesus petitioning us to com combat our, our bad habit of judging and condemning others, pr provoking us to first look inward and to recognize our own faults and to emerge from that introspection full of humility, empathy, and relational vulnerability. And these, all of these, they get sandwiched in between two slices of God view bread. Uh, now, now, the first slice, it, it warns us of the importance of having a healthy eye, a healthy view of our Heavenly Father, while the concluding slice encourages this healthy view. Right? Ask your Father, and He will give. Seek your Father, and you will find Him. Knock on your father's door and he will open up because that's who he is. He is a good, good father. This third part then, is it's kind of like a map inside of a map. 
right? The the inner introspection map it guides us to a healthy it, it guides us to healthier mindsets and worldviews so that we aren't bogged down by worrying about the wrong things such as money or survival or that our rude neighbor will get what's coming to them and instead we will be unhindered and free to experience the blessed life of the kingdom. And meanwhile, the, the outer God view sand, sandwich bread map, the, the outer God view map, it guides us as far as how to actually do that. The secret to having those healthier mindsets and worldviews is to have a proper view of our Heavenly Father. Now, uh, all three of these sections, right, dealing with our relationships with, with others with God and with ourselves, uh, they are all summed up in one brief teaching at the very end. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And, and we can know that this sums up all three sections because of an earlier slice of bread. Uh, you see, back in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then, uh, as we discussed last week, these are sandwiched between grace and duty. right? The, the grace, the, the invitation and opportunity presented in the Beatitudes map, it claims that the kingdom, this relationship with our Heavenly Father and the blessed life that accompanies it, it, it has been made available to us. And then Jesus lays out instructions for how to live as members of this kingdom and as subjects of our king. And, and he concludes with the four do's, the duty, right, telling us to practice what he preaches. Because while our admittance into the kingdom is based on grace alone, once we join, grace is joined by duty. Our proper response to grace, our proper response to grace is obedience, and obedience is how we be the salt, and it's how we shine the light, and it's how we make the peace. And so, um, as I, I hope you can see, it is all one big map. It's instructions telling us that we must begin at grace. If you don't start there, you immediately start out lost. And until you find it, until you find that starting point of grace, you will remain outside of the kingdom. But, but then once you find the starting place, once you find the grace, it's like you've only just begun because from there Jesus beckons you to travel further down the path of grace to see what more this king and his kingdom of grace have to offer. And so if you need help getting your bearings and finding that starting point, you know, reach out to me or, or if you are on the path and journeying forward, right, keep going and keep reviewing this map as you do to ensure you don't get lost. But I've got, a, I've got one last thing to reveal about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount map. Because you see, the best maps are, of course, treasure maps, aren't they? The best maps are treasure maps. And, and every good treasure map has an X marks the spot. And as it turns out, Jesus' map has one too. You see, Jesus' sermon opens with the Beatitudes, of which there are nine. But of these nine, one is not like the rest. The first eight, they are all in the third person. You know, blessed are they, blessed are them, blessed are those who. Blessed are those people who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those people who are meek and who mourn. Blessed are those people who are merciful and are persecuted. But, but then suddenly comes the ninth beatitude. Blessed are you. You. Right? And, and this is immediately followed by more second person statements. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And from there we get into our hefty sandwich with our law and our prophet bread. Uh, but, but, but then something interesting happens in the four do's. You see, the first two do's, they occur in the second person, right? Uh, second person commands, you enter through the narrow gate. 
you watch out for false prophets. While the final two do's exist in the third person. Not everyone will enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. So, you can see, I hope, uh, that it's like two halves of a third-person bagel, right? Uh, two, two halves of a third-person bagel surrounding two halves of a second-person croissant surrounding two slices of law and prophets, honey wheat bread, surrounding these three sections of, of kingdom living instructions, right? You've got your meaty how-to-treat-people section plus your, your cheesy how-to-be-in-relationship-with-God section, right? Cheese is marvelous, so that's pretty fitting. And, and then comes your tomato-y how-to-think-and-feel section, and, and admittedly, you know, maybe I've gone a bit off track with this whole sandwich metaphor, but, but to get back to our map metaphor, what, what we find when we take these three sections in the middle and, and we look at the middle of the three is that it itself is split into three, right? Give, pray, fast. And when we look at the middle of those, we find an interruption in the midst of his focus on hypocrites and secrecy, well, Jesus momentarily interrupts himself. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who pray for show, but, but also do not be like the pagans who babble and say many words in the hopes of being heard. Instead, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Yes. At the very center of his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has placed the Lord's Prayer. X marks the spot. Now, uh, the implications of this are profound yet simple. The Lord's Prayer sits at the center of the sermon because ultimately, when it comes to actually living out and fulfilling every single bit of this sermon, the key to it all is our relationship with God. We cannot do it apart from the Holy Spirit. We will bear no fruit when disconnected from Jesus, the true vine. And our experience of the blessed kingdom life is fully dependent upon our relationship with our Heavenly Father. We cannot have the kingdom without the King. And so in the same way that Jesus buries the Lord's Prayer at the center of his sermon, we should bury the Lord's Prayer at the center of our lives and let it take root. Pray it every day and make your relationship with God the most important treasure in your life. Amen.